Hey everybody, welcome to Life is Vertical. I am Anthony, and I am so very happy to be back, back to filming, back to editing, back to releasing videos. It has been a very long hiatus, six, seven months, I think. But it was not just wasted time. In fact, I was given the opportunity of a lifetime to be able to travel to Turkey and actually live in the country for six months, working, living, experiencing the culture, all in the capital city of Ankara. During this time, I got to see some of the earliest civilizations of mankind. I was able to see fantastic, wondrous, near fairy tale level sights, and just, it was an absolutely amazing experience. And although I would love to just rant on and on and on about my adventures, what I wanna to talk to you about today is Turkey's beer history. Now, Turkey does have a very interesting relationship with beer. They are not the most excited when it comes to alcoholic beverages with a survey that was recently conducted saying that over 80% of Turkish citizens either don't drink alcohol to include beer and if they do very seldomly and not beer. Despite this, they have an extreme intimate connection with alcohol, in particular the grape liquor known as Rocky, which is served with dinners, feasts, appetizers, it's a very commonly drank beverage. With beer specific, they are actually one of the oldest societies in mankind to have ever brewed beer. And it's this deep personal connection with beer that I really wanna to try to share and convey to you. So let's start from the beginning. When I first landed in Turkey, the first number one beer on my bucket list was to try something known as Boza. I first learned about Boza while researching Turkish beer before my journey. I knew it was supposed to be thick and pale in color, but nothing could prepare me for this cloyingly sweet bottle of what appeared to be closer to yogurt than beer. It was certainly a surprise to say the least, but it only intrigued me to learn more about this mysterious beer. Now I know what you're thinking. You're probably saying to yourself, Anthony, that is not a beer, not at all. Well, you're right, but you're also not right. Boza in the eyes of the modern Turkish citizen, they see it more as a sweet, yogurty, dessert-like beverage served warm on a cold winter night. It has very little to no alcohol at all. And if you try to tell a Turk that it is beer, they will vehemently deny it and they will aggressively argue with it. But let's look at what Boza is exactly. It is made of crushed grain, mixed with hot water, and then left to ferment for several days, and then pour it up and served out. Kind of sounds like a beer to me. It meets almost all the check boxes of ingredients and how to make a beer, right? But you're still probably saying to yourself, it just doesn't look like a beer. Fair enough, because in a way, it's not a beer. What it actually is, is a proto-beer. Now, what a proto-beer is, is it's what beer was before beer was beer. The early Anatolian people along Turkey's southern coast would take millet, crush it up into a fine powder, mix it with the water till it was thick and gloopy, and then they would put it in a clay pot when it was still really hot, bury it underground for several days for it to cool off. During this cooling off period, the climate became perfect for the naturally occurring yeast, bacteria, and other microbes to begin fermenting the sugars within the gloop, producing alcohol. They would then dig it up and consume it. Beer. It is basically the missing link between what started beer and what beer is today. Now, Bosa does have an incredibly deep and complex history that is way too long to fit within this video, so I am gonna to have to make that its own entirely separate video. I'm very sorry for that, but there's just so much cool stuff about it and that I want to talk about. And I just don't have the time in here because we still got a long way to go. Anyways, what I'm trying to get at is Boza is just the only proto beer in existence that I know of that still resembles what it looked like 5,000 years ago and it's still available on the market. Turkey was the only place that I could think of where I was able to drink proto beer and modern day beer within the same restaurant, same point in time. And that was incredibly interesting and an extremely unique experience. 
Can't wait to tell you more about it. Stay tuned for that video. Now, moving forward just a few thousand years, beer in the region had developed to what we would be able to identify as a beer. This story is incredibly cool to me because I got to go to King Midas's tomb. And why that's so cool to me is because Dogfish Head's Midas Touch is a collaboration with the beer Indiana Jones, Dr. Ames, who actually went to these tombs, scraped some clay pots, and were able to recreate an ancient ale. And that's important to me, one, because that's just a freaking awesome chunk of beer history there. But two, Midas Touch Beer was the first beer review I ever saw on YouTube. It was the first craft beer I really fell in love with. And it's actually the whole reason, those two things fused together, why I actually decided to start a YouTube channel about beer. So this was kind of like a mecca journey for me. Unfortunately, the town was very small, not a whole lot going on there. Most uh, people in the village didn't speak English at all. Very hospitable, they would offer you tea left and right, but there was no way you were able to actually drink or ingest or taste the beer that was spawned from that region, which I did find a bit disappointing, but out in these little villages, it's a little bit more conservative and you're, you'll be pretty hard pressed to be able to find any actual beer to drink. All right, so let's move forward a little bit further into the dawn of Turkey's modern beer history, which is still in the 1700s. <laughs> the concept of modern beer and actual Turkish beer culture started with the Ottoman Empire in the 1700s. There was a Swedish army who had been at war with Russia and they actually got pushed back far enough where they needed to seek refuge. And the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire actually offered them a safe harbor within Constantinople. The Ottoman Empire was incredibly non-alcoholic friendly due to the strict religious aspects that they applied to their citizens. However, they did grant exceptions to some foreigners, including these Swedes. The Swedes were really, they, they really wanted some beer. So the, Turk, or the Ottoman Empire actually agreed to allow them to teach some locals and open up a brewery that would be able to produce enough beer to satisfy all of the soldiers. With this knowledge and this newfound interest, the people of the Ottoman Empire started home brewing as well as the state-sponsored brewery. And they would sell them to the soldiers on the down low to make a couple extra dollars. And that was the start. That's what ingrained beer into the culture. Because of the relaxation of this one rule, that allowed the Turkish people to get a appetite and thirst for beer. And in the late 1800s, two Swiss brothers actually moved to Constantinople to open up a brewery. This was known as the Bamanti Brewery, and it was the first privately owned, fully personally operated brewery in Turkey's history. It just caught on like wildfire. All of a sudden, there were European beer pubs and there were beer gardens popping up all over the city. And it spread down to Angora and then it started moving over to Izmir on the far coast. There was just a massive vacuum and the Bamanti brothers were there to satisfy. Bamanti opened up the gates for the brewing revolution. And there was such a mass demand for beer that rival breweries started popping up all over as competitors. In fact, it was so good that by 1909, all the breweries in the Ottoman Empire together were making 9 billion liters of beer annually. Unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end and the Ottoman Empire fell following the conclusion of World War I. Rising out of the Ottoman Empire's ashes was the Republic of Turkey. And with the Republic of Turkey's birth, they also wanted to usher in new modern ideas. We saw a lot of westernization in order to revolutionize the industrial market and to bring in outside investors to really bolster the fledgling nation. Competition exploded in many sectors. Unfortunately, some industries were nationalized to include tobacco, to include public transportation, and unfortunately, beer and brewing. Over time, the Turkish government incorporated every single privately owned brewery into one massive state-sponsored conglomerate known as Dikel. And it was so oppressive and so dominating that you couldn't even find a beer made from a brewery outside of Dikel until the 1970s. Fortunately, over time, the government did loosen their grip on these industries and the private sector started booming again. The Turkish government really wanted to focus on tourism as a sense of capital and revenue growth, 
and they needed to make a welcoming environment for the Europeans who would be the primary tourists in the country. This touristic boost caused the beer industry to grow by over 20% in the first year. You also saw the foundation of some of the major big name breweries that are still around today like Ephes and even Bamonte made a comeback. Now would be a good time to take a little detour away and talk about Turkish beer brands and Turkish beer offerings. Turkish beer is good and skillfully crafted, I would say. The problem is the majority of its offerings are all pale adjunct lagers. There's so many different types of pale adjunct lagers. There's extra, which is a couple more ABV points and maybe a bit heavier of a mouthfeel. You have filtresses, which is filtered. non filtresses which is the opposite, a little bit more cloudy, a bit more murky. There's light. I mean, there, there's a whole spectrum. But they're pretty much all produced by one or two major beer conglomerates that have a death grip on the entire industry, basically. So, honestly, not too different than the States. Now, fusing those two stories back together, the interesting thing about the Turkish tourist beer boom there was just a massive expansion in interest in European beer styles. And we started seeing several different major international breweries start investing heavily within the region, such as Bex, Miller, Tuborg, um, Heineken. Just a bunch of people started really shoving their beers into the region. And if they didn't think that the quality would hold up the shipment all the way down there, they would actually just open up breweries within the country. And these new breweries really focused on satisfying that European itch. Some breweries brought in German brewers to come and try to modernize and produce or recreate European beer styles for the Turkish market. Some who were already existing in Europe just started a special line only available in Turkey to kind of capture that European pen flash. Specifically, Tuborg. Tuborg released a series known as the Frederick series, named after their legendary first head master brewer. But they came out with an IPA, a English brown ale, and a Marzen style beer, only available in Turkey. And to be honest, they were pretty dang good. So moving on, as much as I love European beers and I love their interest in European and Belgian beer styles, one of the things that I was most excited for was being able to get a first-hand glimpse at the fledgling Turkish craft beer scene. Across the nation, especially in the major cities, you were able to find a wealth of extremely hoppy ales and lagers. You were able to see stouts and honestly, one of the best saisons I've ever had in my entire life. The king of Turkish craft beer is the Garaguzu Brewery, out, just outside of Bodrum. Garaguzu translates to black sheep. That name is incredibly fitting for them because even amongst other Turkish craft beers, they just absolutely stood out. They were in a whole nother league. They were the superior, the premium beer. And even though it was so much better than the European imports, it still sold for a relatively cheap price of around 25 to 30 lira. While at the same time, you could pick up like a bigger name beer like Aleffa for 70, 80 lira. I truly fell in love with Garaguzu. It reminded me of the early days of the US craft beer boom. It's a small family owned brewery producing good beer simply for the act of making better beer for those seeking it. I believe Garaguzu can be and should be the blueprint of how future Turkish craft breweries make a name for themselves. Producing an honest quality craft beer for the love of craft beer. But in conclusion, I loved Turkey and I think they have such an interesting and unique connection and history with beer as well as a really unique, I would say, beer culture. It is a country that is full of beauty, adventure, mystery, history, just awesome. And that expands into every aspect of their life, including beer, because where else are you going to be able to drink a proto beer along with a fresh craft beer brewed with, you know, exotic hops and locally sourced from a region that often gets overlooked, you know, 
Like it's just so dang cool. If you are looking for some adventure in your life, if you are looking to see some of the most unique beer experiences available, highly encourage you to go and check out Turkey. I know it gets kind of a bum rap in the news and press and everything, but genuinely, I've never felt safer in a country. I've never felt more welcomed in a country. Everyone was so polite, so hospitable. They will literally give the shirt off their back to you if it means they, they help you out in some way. I just really love Turkey and I love the beer chasing experience. I know for a fact some of my best memories throughout my entire life were spent there. And the greatest sense of beer adventure I've ever had was there. You know, it is just always going to be a special place in my heart. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a little bit about Turkish beer history and Turkish beer culture. I have a couple more videos in the works on Turkey, but I don't want to like bog y'all down with that, so I'm going to spread them out. Additionally, my six months there were not wasted. I have typed over 30 or 40 different beer scripts ranging from a variety of topics. So. Stay tuned for that because this year is going to be jam-packed. I'm going to stay on my grind. Thank you very much for watching. Glad to be back. Thank you for having me back. And I will see you next week. Oh, yeah. I had a sign-off, didn't I? <laughs> Thank you. Like, comment, subscribe. And remember, there's a story in every bottle and that life is brutal. Cheers.